guys, good evening. So tonight I am doing an edigami workshop for you guys. Thought it'd be fun for us to hang out and um, just kind of a fun way to kind of kill some time. So the images I have to show you guys are, we can do this one, we can do this one, or we can do the big daylily, but I'm really leaning towards this one here. And if you guys check the description, you'll find that there's a link for those in the description below. So what I want to do before we kind of dive into that and just kind of checking and making sure everything works is I wanted to walk you guys through kind of what edigami is and different supplies used for this. I have a bunch of tutorials coming up on the channel. Some of my art nerds already have them. But edigami is basically loose watercolor postcards. So it's generally intended to kind of celebrate the season that they were sent or that they were created in. And it's not intended to be perfect. It's intended to be something that you do yourself that you send to someone else. So these are some of the ones that I've been working on recently. I brought a bunch of different edigame papers with me when I went to Louisiana and I got a little bit stranded while I was there. So this provided a really kind of nice way for me to kind of center myself, to find something positive to work on and just to kind of find a way to regroup. So those are some example edigami postcards. With Japanese ones on the back, you'll see that they're just traditional Japanese postcards. You put a stamp here, you write the postcard or the postal, and then you write like your message and the address. Um, something else that differs in the way they're traditionally done is it's traditional to write a nice little message on the front. My handwriting is pretty atrocious, so I thought with these, I would just kind of leave it let the image speak for itself and I actually want to mail these out to folks in the near future in fact um, before tonight I had them all bagged up ready to go and I decided to unbag them so I could show you guys so those are just some examples of edigami art you can see more of it on my instagram at instagram.com slash soup and I've been sharing clips um, from the tutorials to my instagram in fact off camera I have my phone. You guys can't see it, but you'll probably see me reach over. So as I'm working on this workshop, I may turn my phone off and on to capture parts of that. So this is what we're going to be making. The materials you guys need for this, first off, I want to say, um, don't you don't have to go out and buy anything. You don't have to hurry up and hit up Amazon if you're brand new to this. If you've never done edigami before, what you probably already own is probably good enough. But edigami is typically done on a special kind of paper. And this paper differs from Western watercolor papers in a few different ways. Um, it is, you'll usually find these packs like Kuratake edigami. Um, in the description, I have a link to the Akashia edigami paper. It's one of the ones here. It's, it's this one. And I did this painting on it yesterday. So it's pretty decent. And one of the ways it differs is it has like a Gunsen paper or a Gassen paper or a washi paper on top of it. So kind of a mulberry paper rather than like a cotton rag paper or like the cellulose paper you might be used to. So edigame paper is gonna handle watercolors more like sumi paper would and less like Western style watercolor paper would. But there are some more Western style options like this one here. It's more like a cardstock, and it, I have an example. It doesn't handle like edigami paper at all. So if you're doing this along at home this evening, and I kind of hope you are, you can work on kind of like a, um, a pressed cardstock, like the Ranger uh, watercolor paper is a pressed cardstock. A lot of cellulose papers are really just an embossed cardstock, a cardstock with a watercolor texture on it. Um, you can also work on cotton rag paper if you so wish. You basically can work on anything you have handy. But if you want to play around with edigami postcards, and I think you should after you've painted a couple and you decide this is something you want to play around with more, um, I would recommend getting the real deal. And there are a lot of different options available. 
from several different brands. Some of them are easier to find than others. And one of the big complaints about um, edagame watercolor paper is that it bleeds too much, but that's a working property. That's actually something, a desirable trait with this paper. So that's something you're gonna wanna look for. So something else you're gonna want to use is you're going to want your watercolors. And you can use Western style watercolors for this if you want to. It's actually more traditional to use Gensai style watercolors. So if you guys remember when the Gensai Tombi set was super duper popular among uh, crafters and card makers, this set is actually typically used for edagami postcards. And basically what it is is just prepared um, Gensai style watercolors using Nikuma binder, which is like an animal hide glue binder rather than like gum arabic or aquazol or honey or dextrin. You're using kind of an animal glue. So they do handle a little bit different than Western watercolors. They're also designed to be a little more opaque and they're designed to be handled much more thickly. So this is the Gensai Tombi. I want to say this is the 24 piece set, but it might be the 36 piece set. And typically Gensai style watercolors come in really large sets because you're not going to be doing a whole lot of color mixing. You're mostly going to be working with the colors you already have. The set I've been using a lot for my Edagame postcards is the Mozart Komorebi set. It's a little bit cheaper. It comes in a metal carrying case. The half pans are smaller, so it kind of travels a little bit more easily. This is what I'm going to be using for today's workshop. And these are really Gensai style watercolors as well. You can definitely tell when you open them up. Um, I know they look kind of like Western full pans, but they handle a lot like Gensai style watercolors. So that's the Mozart Como Rebi set. You're also going to want your brushes. You don't have to use Sumi or Chinese uh, watercolor brushes, but um, I find they work really well for this. I find they're really fun to use for this. And um, it's, they, they're very inexpensive. You can find them in uh, lots of different stores from like Michael's has them sometimes. Lots of art supply stores have them. You can get them on Amazon as well. Uh, the Princeton ones I have, I actually like a lot. I also have some Boku Undo Menso brushes and some Kuratake Menso brushes in here. But if you're just starting out, you don't have to have like a big collection of them. You just kind of work with what you've already got. Um, then I'm gonna use a pencil to sketch my design. Um, typically it's more traditional to just go straight in it with a brush, but if you're not comfortable just going straight into watercolor, having a pencil handy is great. And I'm using H lead in here. And then after, once everything's had a chance to dry, I'm going to ink it and I'm inking it with uh, Pentel pigment ink. This is the extra fine brush. You can see it has a bit more like a traditional brush in terms of shape. It has good flexibility. So some uncommon ingredients for edagame. Um, I'm gonna be using a piece of chipboard here and I'm also going to use some washi tape. And no one's gonna see the washi tape, so you don't have to use, I would recommend you don't use something cute. So I'm going to be painting these azalea buds. This is a photo that I took when I was in Louisiana. I'm gonna turn off my desktop for just a minute, um, check the chat and get some things set up. You've got a lot of things to change. What's wrong? Uh, you, focus isn't off. you didn't set the exposure right, and your audio isn't right. I think. Oh. Okay. Well, I'm gonna let Joseph come on over here and make some changes for me while I go grab a couple of other things. It's good to see you guys. You are absolutely not late. We've barely just gotten started.
wow. Thank you so much for getting that all handled. Dang, you were fast. So something I forgot to grab earlier is a plastic palette. Um, it's not mandatory. You can use like a ceramic plate from Dollar Tree or whatever, but I'm just going to use it to help with some of my color mixing. And something that's off camera, but handy is a cup of clean water. So one of the first things I wanna do is I want to, and I'm gonna try not to get in the camera. I wanna go ahead and get my workspace set up. All right, I think I've got my other camera rolling. Okay, so this is the paper I'm gonna be working on today. One of the reasons I like it is I have a fair amount of it and it comes pad bound. So this is the front, this is the back. And I usually don't use the first sheet in any watercolor pad because those have a tendency of tearing. So we remove it carefully. I put it back in the bag just because it helps prevent it from getting beaten up and dirty. We're going to flip it over and then I'm going to take that washi tape and really any low tack tape will work. So you could use like blue masking tape or masking tape. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to adhere it to the underside of my arm. And the reason I'm doing that is to just remove a little bit of the excess stickiness from the tape so it doesn't tear the paper when we're removing it. And then, kind of double fold it over. And I highly recommend you work with clean hands for this. So not wet hands, but clean hands. And just making sure everything looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish setting up my workspace. You know what? You would probably be correct because you've been taking Japanese for years. Yeah, but if, if it's an Americanized thing, mm -hmm. it might be etagame. Where, where did you hear etagame from? The pronunciation or where did I hear about it? Where did you hear the pronunciation from? Uh, I've, I think from a Sadie, Sadie Saves the Day video a long time ago. My pronunciation is usually pretty abysmal. <laughs> especially for Japanese. So I apologize for that. All right, so I have my workspace set up. One of the first things I wanna do now is I wanna start sketching from reference. So I'm going to turn the desktop cam back up and just quickly go back to the sketched reference. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have that up for the majority of this. And this is a pretty quick art form. If you're doing it along at home, it's probably going to take you, all right, close your eyes guys, cause I'm gonna man, ooh, I hit my camera, which is never great. Give me a sec. Just zooming in a little bit so you guys can better see what I'm doing. This is a fairly quick form of watercolor. Um, what's going to take a long time is going to be your dry time. You're not necessarily spending a lot of time painting. And y'all are absolutely welcome to use my reference image here. I took this photo uh, in my mom's flower bed when I was in Louisiana a couple weeks ago. So it is my photo, I own the rights to it. Y'all definitely have my permission to use it. 
So I drew two circular shapes to indicate the larger flower and then the bud of the flower. Then I drew a smaller bud here and I may actually budge and draw another bud there. And I drew a leaf and a couple leaves up here. So with our flower, we want to kind of break it down into petal shapes. I'm sketching it really, really light. I don't intend on erasing it, but if I mess up, I'm just going to redraw it. And generally the paint will hide any sort of redraw mistakes. So with this bud up here, it's more like a cup shape. So I'm going to draw the petals to try and indicate that. And I can't see the chat. So Joseph, if anybody asks me any questions, please read, read them out loud to me. Let me know. Okay. okay. You Thank you. Pop out I could, but I don't necessarily want it showing up toasted in the video. Oh, hey, Jill. Good to see you. I see, see you. <laughs> Happy Saturday. And then I have one of the petals here down at the bottom of the flower kind of curled around. And then for the bud, we can see a lot of overlapping of petals, but this is a pretty simplified art form. So really what I want to do instead of capturing every single one is just kind of sketch a few. That's something I really like about edigami is it's really very approachable because it's intended to be put into the mail and sent to someone. It's not necessarily intended for like, you can use it for journaling. I, I've seen uh, some listings for like edigami sketch journals. Um, you can use it as part of your bullet journaling routine as well, but there's, it's kind of intended to be kind of an immediate art form that's sent to other people. So perfection isn't what's valued. It's really like the sentiment, the thought and the care that you're putting into it. And that's something I really like about this art form. Oh, I have a link in the description below where you can download these photos and practice with them. So you can draw along that way. You don't have to be tied to the tiny, tiny reference. reference. Yeah. hope everybody's holding up well. Okay, so all I really did was I just kind of tightened up uh, my sketch of the flower. So next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by laying in the background. And this one's pretty easy. We've got a lot of green. So what I'm going to do, what I like about this palette is I can just remove my pans, which makes for a more appealing visual on y'all's end. You can actually see what I'm doing. Jill said she came along tonight. Nice. But her edigami paper has gone on a walkabout. <laughs> so she's using watercolor paper instead. That works too. Um, Sorry, I went for a walkabout. I know all about that though. <laughs> Disappearing art supplies. So what I wanna do tonight is I wanna keep the background for this really simple, but I'm also gonna kinda celebrate the wet into wet blending that this paper is able to achieve. And if you're painting along and you're not working with this kind of paper, you're just gonna wanna make sure you, if you really want that wet into wet, you're just gonna wanna get in quicker because this paper stays open a little bit longer maybe not this one we've already got a little bit of staining but that's all right and it's also going to vary based on um, the area of the country you live in and the humidity in that area 
when I was doing these in Louisiana, my dry time was about 30 minutes each stage. So I would work on like cooking dinner or we'd go for a walk around the block and basically try to stay isolated but active. In Nashville, people are a little bit more on top of each other than they were in suburban near rural Louisiana. So I'm just gonna be in. And I'm leaving a little bit of a halo. That's just because these paints do tend to be really blendy. They tend to be very bleedy and um, it's just for control issues. Basically it's like a border because we're gonna be painting like a really nice fresh pink there. I don't wanna pollute it too, too much. I kind of, I'm of two minds about that. Um, it's, it, this is going to sound really rude. It's not rude at you. It's just how I feel about it. Um, I feel like it gets to a point where it's a bit like a parlor trick for me. Um, and I love doing it and I think it's important. And I think the more one does it, the better one gets at it, but it gets to a point where I can just like turn off my brain and I don't have to think anymore. That said, um, I'm also coming at this from, I used to do conventions, like anime conventions and uh, comic conventions for a living. And I suffer from really bad migraines too. So I would take commissions at these shows and it got to the point where I was getting really sick, but I would still need to fill my commissions. So um, kind of going into that auto zone of being able to draw things without having to uh, think too hard about them became a really, really important skill set. But I don't know if you've read the, I think his name is um, Malcolm, Mc, no, it's the guy who wrote the Outliers book, but he also uh, talks a lot about 10,000 hours towards mastery. So the more time you put into it, the better you're going to get at doing it. I enjoy painting from reference, um, but it's more of like a, a meditative thing for me because I don't have to think too, too much about the subject matter and what kind of story I'm trying to tell with it. But one of the things I like about this particular art form too is it's um, the imperfection is part of its charm. So just the fact that somebody cared enough and took the time to make one to send is a big part of the charm and what makes it really wonderful. So now I'm just kind of, I'm not trying to recreate, recreate the background too much. There's been recent postcards where I got really too literal and it looks more like a mess than anything else. So I'm just trying to give an impression of the background and just trying to create some contrast for the foreground image to pop. And I'm working way thicker with these than I would with Western style watercolors. I'm really layering it on because with edagame, the, you can't like layer and glaze the way you would with Western style watercolors. So you can't um, paint something pretty thickly and then decide later you wanna adjust the color by adding like a shadow layer on top of it, especially if the paper's still wet because what that's going to do is it's basically gonna push all the color that was on the paper 
away and it's going to kind of create a mess. In fact, I feel like I'm already kind of creating a mess. I think I've gone too heavy with this. So, <clears throat> you have to go get a cup of water. I'm going to go ahead and put two of my colors away so they're not out and distracting me. I'm also going to get a fresh cup of water because since we're handling the paint so thickly, it really gets polluted pretty quick. And I'm also going to grab some of my next colors. Yeah, I think so. I've said that to my students before and they'll look at me like, I've just grown like another eye. Okay, so you guys can see how much wet is just sitting on the paper. So now would generally be a good time for, um, if you were doing this at home, for you to go do another activity for a little while, watch an episode of TV. If you have Animal Crossing, play some Animal Crossing, do something with your kid. Um, just kind of whatever you feel like doing that'll distract you for a while. You can't outweight it to dry. You know what I mean? Like if you came back tomorrow, it'd be fine. If you come back a week from now, it'd be fine. So I, we don't have that kind of time tonight. I don't expect y'all to wait around for that. So what I'm going to do, what I'm aiming for is I'm going to go get a cup of clean water, clean out my brushes so that I get some of the excess paint out of them, get some water for me to drink, and hopefully at least some of it will have evaporated a little bit. It's going to push it. Clean water. Clean brushes. I cleaned all of them, even the ones I didn't use. What's a habit? Okay, so obviously it is still pretty pulled up on the paper. That's okay. I'm going to proceed anyway. And I'm just going to try to work around it. So we're going to end up with a fairly large halo around our blossoms, which is totally fine by me. So one of the first things I want to do, so generally, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the workshop, 
generally with edagami, you want to avoid doing too, too much color mixing and you kind of want to avoid super light washes. Um, part of that is the color is just not going to show up as much on this paper as it would on a different type of paper. So for my friends who are working on cellulose paper, you don't have to cake it on as thick as I'm caking it on. I'll break out one of my Christmas presents this year. Joseph had a custom calligrapher's bridge made for me. So that'll give me somewhere for my hand to rest. So what I'm going to do is I am going to just kind of work petal by petal. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to dual wield. So we have a brush with clean water and some of it has been kind of wicked out using a paper towel unless it drips. And we're just going to use that to kind of soften the transition in some areas. So generally, this is more about mark making than I'm really demonstrating. And that's an area I'd really like to improve on in watercolor is my mark making. So I've been studying at home like Chinese watercolor uh, and sumie painting since that is very reliant on the marks that you make. I'm also kind of drawn to the simplicity. Of how those illustrations are handled. These might be a little bit, ah, uh -huh. of course I drip. It's okay, tear off a little piece of paper towel, absorb it in that way, hopefully the paper won't get super wet since that's going to affect the dry time. Joseph, do you know what the humidity is outside by any chance? Thanks. Yeah, I'm just wondering because uh, it's just sort of sitting on the paper a little bit. Which is going to kind of affect how I go in and blend things. It's, it's 8% at huh. 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So now I'm going to use a much smaller brush. Kind of mix a couple of colors there and you can see in the reference we do get some what looks like wet into wet color blending right so while it's still wet I'm just gonna go in and add some of this darker color so that it can kind of diffuse out And now is just such a perfect time of year for this kind of watercolor since 
for so many people, they're getting kind of the first blossoms of spring, or maybe their gardens are just kind of exploding into full bloom right now. I know like Louisiana and parts of Texas are like that. So this can be kind of a nice way to celebrate that. And if you're in an area yet that hasn't yet hit spring, it could be kind of a way to anticipate it because y'all are going to start having like crocuses and daffodils and some of the little snowdrops peeking their heads out above the snow. All right, now we're going to be tri wielding. And you can kind of see, I added a little bit of extra water there, how it pushes that back a bit. And some papers are going to be more reactive than others. And some are going to be way more bleedy than others. And if you're like me, and you cannot read any Japanese at all, uh, Google Translate does a, a decent enough job of providing at least an understandable translation. It keeps wanting to translate paper to PETA, but you know, that's, it's improved a lot over the past three years. I'll give it that. And I know right now not everyone has the capacity, either mental or physical, to learn a new art form or to, to put that time into art. A lot of artists are talking about feeling kind of burnt out and um, just completely creatively drained right now. That's one of the reasons I like working from references. I don't have to feel particularly inspired. I just have to have a backlog of pictures I really like, images I really like. And uh, that kind of in spot does some of the work for me. Sorry about that. And what's nice about this is it keeps me in the moment um, while not like just completely drowning in the moment, if you guys know what I mean. So it's um, extremely relaxing. It's very quiet. It's like self-soothing. I can do this on my own. I don't have to be anywhere. I can just kind of find a quiet space. And in some of the videos I've, I've shared with patrons, I'm working at my mom's kitchen table. Like it was, it's not like a fancy workspace, you know, for something like this, for an art form like this, it's very small. It's very compact. The materials are very limited. Basically, once you have your materials for one, you can just keep on going. It, it doesn't require a lot of art supplies. It doesn't even necessarily require a lot of ability, um, especially if you're sending it to someone who would just be delighted to hear from you. You know, like they, they're just going to be happy that you are doing okay and you made them some art. And you can even, hopefully, I mean, in my, my dream fantasy world, you can even kind of start up a correspondence where you're sending each other edagame postcards that you're both painting. And then part of the joy is in seeing what you receive each month and what you can send each month. And it kind of can take some of the pressure of like having to make this beautiful piece of art off your shoulders. And then the fact that this art form is also intentionally loose. It's supposed to be looser. It's not supposed to be um, photo realistic. It, it's just so much more accessible in my opinion. Maybe the reason I like it is I'm a, I'm a comic artist, so we spend a lot of time cartooning things, and edagame is about cartooning. Calvin Zero said, uh, they live in a tropical environment. Yeah. In the spring, flowers bloom all year round. Yeah, that, I, not quite like that from where I'm from, but very, very close. And he also said Google Translate uh, often comes back with nonsense to results. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's gotten better, but it used to be really, really 
really bad. Like, ad like even Google was like, yeah, we know we're bad. Um, I don't have any, like, connection to Google whatsoever. Um, I'm just refer uh, referring it or recommending it just because a lot of us don't read or speak any. The only that use well, it's that or, or learn the language or have a friend who learns the language. And I'm actually fortunate in that Joseph knows a little bit. Um, another friend of mine online knows a lot more than him. And this friend also is very interested in art supplies as well. So, so they're very willing to help translate whatever weird things I find. And then I have another friend who's also an artist who is somewhat literate in Japanese. So I, I feel very fortunate that I have several people I can ask for for help. But I, I kind of like going to Google Translate first just because it, it puts some of that power in my hands. Like I'm not entirely dependent on other people. And that way, if uh, I can also come in and be like, okay, this is what Google Translate told me. And they can usually, using context, they can usually give me something much closer. So you can see we're getting some really nice, loose blends. Didn't really have to do a lot of work either. The paper does a lot of the work. So basically, if you don't overwork it, this paper will... You're right, I do. That's a, um, so my mom cannot, she, she has told me this to my face. She cannot watch my videos because I don't sound like myself to her at all. Um, and she also says I sound a lot like an in infomercial. <laughs> so, one I mean, it's, it's probably, it's probably true. But it's also where I'm coming from is I love any art supply that makes things a little easier for people who would like to do these things, but aren't necessarily confident in trying it out. Or people who just want to make something beautiful in a short amount of time, because that's a lot of us as well. Or like I remember when I was first learning watercolor um, and I would have a few successes, but I had a lot more failures and I couldn't really understand like what I was doing wrong because I really just needed to put the mileage on the tires. So having something that is more likely to give you a win. Thank you. That's not... My goal is not to be like an art supply shill, but I'm also pretty passionate about what these things can do for people. And that definitely starts to fall into like the, the uh, art supply evangelist, evangelist camp. Okay, so while our flowers are drying, I'm gonna try to go in using a smaller brush. I'm gonna clean it and get just some green in the background. And I also, I'm gonna switch over to a larger brush. Go up into the leaves. And apply kind of a cooler yellow. And then we're gonna dual wield. So this is like a very young leaf green. So all I wanna do is just dab a little bit of green into our yellow, just so that it starts to diffuse. 
that's I think that's it. That yeah, I feel that. Um, I can, I can tell you that it. The more you do it, the better it's going to get. And sometimes for me, it's easier when I'm in that hypercritical mode. It's easier for me to do studies instead, working from reference. Um, and part of that is we're not competing necessarily with the vision we have in our head. So I've grabbed some Payne's gray. I'm going to use this to kind of help set up a brown. Um, we're not competing with the vision we have in our head versus what our hands can replicate. You have an actual reference image you're working from, and it's much easier to kind of evaluate the areas where you didn't quite hit the goal. And it's also often easier when you're working from reference to be able to get feedback from other people on where you kind of missed your mark because you can show them the reference and they can see, you know, where things didn't quite. So I'm dabbing in a little bit of burnt sienna into the Payne's gray. Um, they can kind of see the areas where you fell short and they may be able to tell you what you can do in the future to improve that. Whereas if you're working from imagination, it's often hard for other people to see where you were trying to go in terms of art style. But I believe in you. And now, if you have the energy to do it, um, now is a great time to just kind of knuckle down and work on those fundamentals. And so, I'm going to go in with this sort it's like a red violet color. And if it's too much, and you may decide some areas are too much and some areas are not, you can go in with a wet brush and just kind of soften that line a little bit. So how would someone know if watercolors are Eastern style other than looking at all of the Asian characters on the packaging? Um, you know, I wish it would. Often it's all in Japanese, so or or Korean or Chinese. So that they can be. Um, so opaqueness can be um, a reason to use them for this. Uh, like Turner watercolors are Japanese watercolors. They do not use Nikuma as the binder. They're not designed to be. Um, like Chinese style or Japanese style watercolor, but they are much more opaque in general than typically Western watercolor brands like Winsor Newton or Sennelier are. So you could definitely use Turner for this if you want to. On that note though, Magello has some of the best color purity I've seen. Like they have some really, really clean colors. So, um, if you wanted to do this at home, what I would suggest, and you wanted to use these kind of, the right, I say the right in heavy air quotes, um, the, the right kind of watercolors, you could buy anything that says Gansai, G-A-N-S-A-I. Um, that's the style of watercolor. So um, there's lots of different brands that make Gansai style watercolor. So the Kuratake Gansai Tambi is a very popular option. You can find it at a lot of places. Um, I, I find like it tends to just be a little bit more expensive, but that's not, it's, it's and compared to Western watercolors, it's very cheap. So they're, they're not actually that expensive. It's just when I'm doing these kind of watercolors and I'm painting really heavily, I tend to go through a lot of paint. And the yeah yeah it yeah it's it's almost like um in many areas it's almost like yeah like the the 
Sorry. It's not you. My brain is doing the nice hard shutdown mode it does when it doesn't want to help me out. Yeah. Dicker. Uh, Calvin Zero said my imagination is still lost somewhere out in the void, so I can only paint from reference. <laughs> yeah, but when it finally comes back, you're going to be so good. You've been sharing your studies on the paint box, and they've just been so impressive. I mean, it's probably like you are out cutting wood and you have an axe. And it's like the difference between having a sharp axe and a dull axe. Because with a dull axe, if you hack away at it enough, you might get there. But with a sharp axe, you're way more likely to actually be able to chop wood. So basically, at this point, we enter a waiting game. How, how detailed you want this to get is going to kind of depend on how much time you have to put in it, how much you feel like going back and painting it, and just your dry times in general, how quick or how slow it's evaporating out into the atmosphere. It doesn't have to get particularly detailed, though, for it to be good, which... Is something I really like about this it's just kind of a satisfying immediate art form I feel like this could also it doesn't have to be flowers by any stretch it can be like kites for example or it could be vegetables or it could be fruit or it could be animals or it could be a kid's tricycle like anything that kind of makes you think of the season or anything that makes you think of the person so to me, this could be a good activity to do with artists of any age, maybe even younger artists, because then they can send them off to each other. So I'm using one of the really small brushes, the really fine brushes, just to go back in to those leaves and just kind of clean them up just a little bit while I wait for everything else to dry. Because what I really want to do is I really want to get into the stem and add more of our Payne's Gray. get that yeah because then even if it looks good when you're comparing the two side by side um, it can be hard especially if you're like you got yourself super psyched about how good it's gonna look maybe it's a subject you've painted before and it looked really good those other times and this time something's just off yeah it it kind of helps in that regard to kind of contextualize it which like for this for example, the context is I know it's not supposed to be perfect. I know it's not supposed to be really, really good. So it makes it easier for me to just do it. But if you decided you wanted to do a watercolor sketch a day, that might help take some of that um, painting from reference pressure off yourself. Or you might be like I am, where then every painting you do, if they're in a sketchbook, they all have to be equally good or you'll get mad at yourself. Sorry, I hope that wasn't gross for y'all. I hope you didn't hear like glug, 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 glug. Trying to stay hydrated, niece. 
these taxing times. So a project I've seen a couple of people do on Instagram that I really like, and um, I may adopt it during uh, World Watercolor Month in July, is they basically created a big watercolor grid and every day they have like a two by two square and they're painting something for that day in that square. Okay, so I'm just going in and I'm kind of defining some of the shadows on some of the petals a little bit better using the original color mix that's probably slightly off camera. This one. But I think my problem, and see like realistically, you know, if this is so, this is something else that I do. Um, I will show someone else, usually Joseph, and I will ask his opinion because sometimes I get too caught up in how I think it should look and I kind of miss like the fact that it is actually good. It just missed the target I'd set in my head. So sometimes asking someone who doesn't have that misconception and isn't laboring under that can help me kind of get my head back on straight. So at this point, I'm basically just overworking it probably adding adding some shadows adding some detail this is going to be entirely up to your discretion what you like how much you want to go into it how much you want to define your color insert food wishes quote here referencing azaleas But I think once that dried, I'm pretty, I'm pretty satisfied with it. Um, it's not my best. It's not my worst. Um, something else that's really nice about doing a series of something is if you just do it every day, it kind of takes the pressure off of individual days to be super good. Um, and you can just kind of have days that are mediocre. But since they're part of the whole, they look better in comparison. You know what I mean? Like with Inktober after I've done 31 drawings, it becomes part of this whole thing. And that whole thing wouldn't exist without every day I put in, regardless of whether or not it was good or bad. Am I, Joseph, am I making sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I said you are the regalia of your azaleas. Yeah, that is pretty good, all right. Thank you for Inserting a Chef John quote. Much appreciated. Okay, everyone say together. Becca, stop. You're overworking it. It's fine. I'm just doing that because I have to wait for it to dry before I can start inking it. So while we wait for it to dry, Actually, this calligrapher bridge works really well. Where'd you get it, Joseph? I don't remember his name. Oh, but it's a local woodworker that you met at Hands On Creativity. Because I saw he had other cool things, but he didn't have any calligrapher bridges, and I kind of made friends with his wife. And I was like, does he make calligrapher bridges? And apparently he's the guy who used to do them for paper and ink arts, but there just wasn't a lot of demand for them, which is kind of crazy to me. Because the whole point is to keep us from having to rest our hand on the paper or from dragging our hand through what we have already created. Okay, so I am gonna go dump my cup of water, get a fresh cup of water. Oh, hey, you found it. I'll leave it here in case anybody is interested in a calligrapher bridge. I just love that A, he makes them himself. So that's really cool and you can choose the material do you know what wood this is? Is it zebra wood? We went back and forth, I forget. Yeah, y'all really, he really worked with Joseph to find a wood that could hold up to how thin I needed it and how close I needed it to the paper because what I initially wanted was just not practical for what 
this can actually do. So I actually really appreciate that he told Joseph no, because to me, when a craftsperson says no like that, it shows that they really care about you being satisfied with the end product for the long term. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go find my white gouache. You can use just white watercolor. The white watercolor in the Mozart set is very translucent for a Gensai style watercolor. So I don't prefer it. I prefer white watercolor. You can also do this with Chinese watercolors, like the Marie's professional Chinese watercolors. You can also do Edagami style painting with those as well. It's going to be a slightly different color palette. Um, so it really kind of boils down to what you like. Don't feel like you have to use very specific materials for this to be like legit because it's not that kind of art, which is something else I really like about it, is it's just very inviting for people with what they have, which is nice. Uh, it's Bolivian Rosewood, and Calvin Zero said, uh, I've been told that it's normal for artists to find their art uh, sucks really badly from time to time when watercolor and being the master artist. <sighs> Boy, yeah, you, you are 130% correct. It's because, um, so as our ability, our skill develops, our taste, our eyes develop too. And your eyes will usually level up, your taste will level up before your hands have caught up to it, which is why working from reference from time to time is great because you're just developing those fine motor skills, right? You're helping your eyes, catch, I mean, your hands catch up with your hands. Um, and when I was in school, I had a professor who told me that gap, you should be excited about that gap. Every time you start looking at your art and you're like, oh, it's kind of sucky, you should get excited because it means it signals you're ready to level up. You're ready to hit that next level. So sometimes um, reframing how you feel about that slump can help you keep pushing through it because um, that is, yeah, it's super normal for everyone. I also know it's really discouraging for ugh, artists of all skill levels when they see someone they admire talking about their own art like that it can feel very discouraging but it's not meant to put anybody else down it's entirely a personal thing because there have been times where I didn't like anything I made but I'll look at a friend's art and absolutely love it and like in my head I know we're kind of at around the same level but because I'm not dealing with my own disappointment in myself I can just purely enjoy the work that they've created. So also sometimes, um, so a trick for that is with art, if I'm unsure about it and it's finished, I'll put it away for a week and then come back to it later and see how I feel about it. Because often, um, once I've kind of gotten past all the feelings I felt while I was making that art, I can look at it with fresh eyes and I can either decide I love it or I can decide what I would do differently and I can learn from it. So if I need to self critique, I give myself about a week to self critique. Um, there was something else I do for that. I can't remember off the top of my head, but giving myself time to like have fresh eyes and to kind of distance myself from the disappointment is a big one for that. Now I need to find my white gouache. And I promise I'm not just talking to fill, I mean, I am talking to fill time, but I'm like watching the watercolor as I'm talking to make sure that uh, it's actually drawing. Tonight, oh gosh, yeah, you're right. appreciate Joseph being such a good reader because it allows me to actually be able to keep up with what you guys are saying instead of spending the whole time either reading what I'm saying or feeling like I'm ignoring y'all okay so when your paper has finally dried and um, so it's no longer like cool to the touch it is still warped it could probably dry even further but when you're satisfied with how dry it is, put that down for a second. 
Um, this is not the one I want. This is the one I want. So this is a Pentel pigment brush pen. These are going to be waterproof once dry. They have this really nice matte ink. So it's not shiny and it's not going to be water reactive. So if your paper's still wet, it might spider a little bit, but it's not going to spider nearly as much as a dye based ink. Um, it also is capable of these really nice dry brush effects and it handles a lot like a traditional brush without kind of the struggle of a traditional brush. I love traditional brushes, but in my opinion, in my art, they have a time and a place and uh, these are much more portable. They're very easy to use. They're very user friendly. So I'm all about finding stuff that like lots of different people can use. And I use the heck out of them during Inktober because they are so accessible. So, apologize because I'm kind of quietly, not so quietly dual wielding camera. So I'm trying to get a decent angle with my phone, which is the secondary cam. And I'm using a five and below phone stand with that right now. So I'm struggling with it just a little bit, but not too much. I'm actually impressed by how well that setup has worked. Okay, so right now I was checking OBS just to make sure everything looked okay. It did. So something I love about this brush pen is you can achieve really, really light, delicate lines and then really nice hefty lines. And then if you want to do any sort of black fill, you can use the medium brush for that. And I think, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me on this. I think the Pentel pocket brush uses the same kind of ink. I'm going to have to double check that like as soon as we finish the stream. But I actually like this better than the pocket brush because the brush itself is longer. So it kind of handles much more like a traditional hairbrush. And you could definitely use like one of your smaller Sumi brushes for this if you want to. But honestly, this is just so easy. It's so compact. I don't have to do any cleanup with it. So I like this better. So part of my advice for doing edigame is don't, when you're just starting out, don't get too, too ambitious. When I was first kind of playing around with this a couple years ago, I would pick subject matter that was a little too ambitious for what I could do with it. And uh, I'm all for people flexing their wings, but if you're in kind of a vulnerable position and you just want to make art that you like, pick something that's a little bit easier and something that definitely inspires you. So if you're not into flowers, don't feel like you have to do flowers. I keep meaning to do a frog one. I didn't want to do a frog one on air for you guys live because I knew I was going to mess it up. Uh, because talking utilizes the same part of the brain that drawing does for me sometimes. So it's better if I do a subject I'm really familiar with because then I can actually talk and draw at the same time. And I do actually have trouble walking and chewing gum sometimes, <laughs> you know. That's okay. People can exist like that. We can survive. And I really think adding the ink line work adds a lot to it and you can decide like if you don't like all the white halo it doesn't bother me actually um so I'm gonna leave it but you can do like a way thicker black outline to kind of cover it up if it bothers you I 
seeing a frog one, but I have all these lizard photos from when I was in Louisiana, so realistically it's going to be a lizard. So then for people with beautiful handwriting, they might write the message up here. Um, if you were doing it in Japanese, you might write it vertically. My handwriting is really, really deceptively un unlegible. So I'll refrain from hand lettering these. But usually they do feature some kind of simple calligraphy on them. Okay, so we're almost done. There's one stage left, and this is pretty simple. It's our white gouache stage. And you're gonna see me do it again because I'm doing it for the second camera. You really don't need a lot for this. I'm probably wasting it a little bit. And for this, I am gonna use one of my smaller Mento brushes clean it out good. You want to add enough water to kind of get a cream consistency. I could probably clean my palette and just leave the gouache in it and reuse it day after day. That's what someone smarter would do. And then I'm just going to carefully draw in stamens maybe add I use a lot I do use a lot of gouache also not every time but I buy a lot of gouache I use a lot of gouache and then on the leaves up here maybe we want to add just a little highlight on the petals. On this one, I left a lot of the white of the paper, which really adds a nice visual bounce. So I actually don't feel the need to go in too, too much. And you don't have to do the white gouache stage at all if you don't want to. To me, I think that the ink line work pulls it together a lot and the gouache is just kind of like icing. All right, so there we go. We are just about done. In real time, it took an hour and 15 minutes, which frankly is not bad for a watercolor project in my opinion. So the next step We just lift it up and gently remove our washi tape. Sometimes it will tear it a little bit. That's not really that big a deal. And there you have it. So the colors on my webcam are not 100% indicative of what this is gonna look like. So what I'm gonna do is after I'm gonna post a picture to the community tab and I'm also going to, of course, put it on like Instagram and stuff. So that's pretty simple, right? And I think now is a really nice time to do something like this because um, so some people have this time that they would like to fill and they'd like to fill it in a way that feels good and feels kind of productive. And for me, this scratches that like productive itch, you know, but it doesn't put a lot of pressure on me to make this big thing. Um, kind of like Kara sometimes does. Now is not always the best time for that kind of stuff, if you guys know what I mean. Um, also, it is something that I, the original intent is to send it off to someone and I think now people really, really would benefit from that kind of 
communication and people checking in and just that kind of heartfelt outreach. This could be really good for that as well. And it's also just a really lovely way to spend an afternoon low stress. You can listen to like your favorite music, you can watch something and just kind of zone out and paint, which is just a really nice way to spend time. So I'm gonna turn off the virtual desktop and I'm gonna check the chat and uh, kind of get caught up and see if you guys have any. <laughs> what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to get a Honko name stamp made so I can be real cool and stamp my work. I love how those look. Um, and I have some designs I've already done for it. It's just more either finding someone who can carve it for me or doing it myself. Daniel Smith is definitely overcoming Windsor Newton in the U.S. because a lot of us are like, support local, yeah. which is cool. Uh, da Vinci is also a U.S. brand. You almost never get da Vinci. I, no, I love Da Vinci. I can't find Da Vinci is the problem. So I have, um, I have, you guys have seen me use this set a lot. I love this set. Oh, Coors U.S., and I own a lot of Coors. Also, the owner of the company is, she's really nice. So, like, you know, it helps. I use it. Um, in fact, I'm going to need to start buying the tube so I can refill it because I really love this palette. Ooh. Yeah, manganese blue is really pretty. Uh, M. Graham, another U.S.-based company makes a beautiful manganese blue. I don't know, I haven't tried their manganese blue hue, but their manganese blue is really nice. I'm just trying You actually called me out. So I recorded, I hit David's, let me, let me pick this up, I'll show you guys, and then I'll end it because I'm losing my voice. Um, Oh, I love my Da Vinci palette. Um, they handle so nice and the colors are really clean and their ultramarine blue is one of my favorites. And it's also just like a nice selection of colors too. The 12 color mixing set just works really, really well. So y'all are gonna see my phone into the shot as I'm a nerd, but that's okay. And then I'll pick that up and I'll show you guys my latest David's haul, which was done right before everything went on lockdown. So I promise I didn't violate anything to go get it. I'm, I'm way too much of like a scaredy cat. Not just in terms of health, although I have a lot of people I love who I would not want to put at risk, but also like some social rules I think are really important to follow. So in terms of like not doing things that put other people in risk, I'm a real rule stickler for that. I like it. Yeah. It's not in some ways it's not the best one I've done, but I'm also proud of myself because I was talking through the whole thing. And usually when I'm talking through the whole thing, it looks like garbage. So I'm proud of myself. Like, yeah, it looked all right. I'm not ashamed. I mean, there's also a popular artist saying that like 30% of every pencil is garbage drawings and you have to get them out somehow. So I just accept that some of my, some things I do are not going to look good. All right, so I will show you. Joseph did not know what was in this package, by the way. Uh, he called me out, but he did not know what was in this. Okay, so. We've got a whole bunch, no, this isn't Holbein, it's Shinhan, the PWC, because David has them for like a really, really good price. So that's like six tubes for $35. Basically they're individual open stock tubes, 
start at 550 for the PWC. So I'm really hoping I'll like it because <laughs> that's a really good price. And um, PWC is their professional watercolor. I've tried their regular watercolor and I was so-so and I've used their alcohol markers and I like their alcohol markers. So we've got paints, we've got a tiny bottle of painting glue, which is very similar to the Nikuma I was telling you guys, if not the exact same thing. Um, this is used to adhere the paints to the paper traditionally. We have a small, uh, sa uh, right, this is sta saddle stitch. No, this is not saddle stitch. We're in it's bound like this, like that. We have a, a no, it's not perfect bound. We have a small sketchbook that's actually large enough to actually be kind of used. We have a sepia copic drawing pen, and then we have uh, we have the watercolor pencil. So Joseph called me out, and he didn't even know he called me out. I'd been given a couple of David's gift cards for Christmas and I wanted to spend them and I did. Anyway, I was called out. He got Coptic stitch. Thank you. See, I can't, I can't do multiple things at the same time. My brain will just fight me every step of the way. So I was, I've been called out. Yeah, well, they were such a good price and I'm really hoping I'll like them. And no gouache this time, because I already have four tubes of gouache at my mom's house and three tubes of gouache here. No, I didn't order any gouache. Probably color eno, because I was out of pink color eno. Okay. I was like, if I was a little concerned, because like I don't put, I don't do subscribe and save on water color anything because that's a dangerous path to hell. Anyway, what kind of pencils are those? Those are the Karen Dodge Museum Acrel watercolor pencils. I'll pull them back out. And I have like a couple of them and I really, really liked them. And Karen Dodge promises that they use, super smart there, that they use the same pigments that um, regular watercolors use, which would be very unusual as, um, so like, and I, I have a bunch of uh, watercolor pencil reviews in the hopper. Like they're done and I just, they either need to be scheduled or patron, patrons have them. But um, most watercolor pencils either use India ink. So um, like the Derwent Inktense or the uh, Faber-Castell, uh, what's his name, Albrecht Durer. Um, so those are all India ink pigments. So they don't handle quite like watercolor pigments. Um, the Windsor Newton watercolor pencils, the new ones supposedly use Cotman quality pigments, which I'm just like, why didn't you not use professional quality watercolor pigments in your pencils? But whatever. Um, but these are supposed to use professional watercolor quality pigments in the pencils. And, um, I only owned a couple. I'm looking for my watercolor pencil kit. Give me a second and I'll grab it. I have a lot of watercolor pencils. Um, I only had a couple because they're pretty expensive. They're like $5 each. So, you know, that's not something I can afford to buy. This is a lot um, for me to buy at one time. But I had gift cards from Christmas, so I didn't feel so bad about it. But, so these are the ones I had already and I really liked them. So I bought a few more colors so I could A, do a mini review of them for you guys, enough to compare. But I also bought like skin tones and stuff that I, I usually need it and I don't have it. And then I'm like, why don't I have this? So um, when I get a chance, I wanna review them for you guys and let you know if they're any good. I think they're good, but I've never like really put them through their paces. Something else is they have like their light fast rating on them and also I forgot what this means. I have to look it up. You know, every pencil has like their own sta non-standard rating for like light fast and what pigments they use. And it kind of drives me nuts. Mm-hmm. Well, 
<laughs> sorry about that guys sometimes in between brands they'll like oh favorite castell is not consistent in there so all their color numbers are consistent because they bought a brand from someone else mm, not necessarily them. it's the pigments they're using they so if you're using they a student grade pigments light fastness system rather than no, system. well, they might. I don't know. I don't know that much about that particular industry insider thing. That would be a, a good question to ask a, a lot of sense. someone. Uh, no. It probably costs money, like like Daniel Smith said. It costs money to run light fastness tests. So if you just adopt the pigments light fastness test, then you don't need to redo that. That makes sense. And between different models, however, I mean. Different Adding different binders can change the permanence of something. So Cindy pointed out that these are supposedly museum quality. Yeah, that's supposed. But but what does that mean? What is like? I'm not arguing with you. I'm arguing with the branding. Is that what it should mean? Is that what it means? Or are you guessing? I'm guessing. See, exactly. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And that's when brands. I want to see, I want to see, okay, I want to see them like go on record to explain because that's another thing all these different, all these different companies have is they all have like different, I don't want to call it like, it's like catchphrases, right? Marketing catchphrases that sound real good, but don't mean a whole lot. And I want them to go on record and give me a definition so I can test for that. looking video of them swooshing around with it instead of anything and they have like a fine artist just swooshing it around it's not like an illustrator so there's literally nothing i can tell from the video but it still triggers that part of my brain that's like i need that yeah what's up am i okay with the quarantine ah that is a good question Oh, cool. Welcome. Um, I'm okay so far. Um, when I was in Louisiana, I was doing better and doing worse for different reasons. In Louisiana, my family has a fairly large yard with lots of nice plants and trees, so I would often just go out and walk around. But my cat was in Nashville, and Joseph was in Nashville, and... Um, I was just very stressed out having no routine because I don't really have a life in Louisiana right now. So like I had more nature, so that may help me deal with it. Um, in Nashville, I don't have as much access to natural spaces, but I have Joseph and I have my cat and I have my art supplies and I have my routine. So it's much easier for me to cope. Stick a tack in the middle of the pencil and put on a pegboard BAM museum. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's some like, I wish I could do that in Animal Crossing. You, there's like a manga cassette in Animal Crossing and you better believe I'm going to be chopping down trees or catching birds or whatever you got to do to get the manga cassette. How do I cope with my ADHD? That is a really good question, and I honestly do not always cope with it. Joseph can testify that I do not always cope with my ADHD. Um, so I am currently unmedicated, which is a big part of the problem. And um, I do plan on, after we get married and I have health insurance, I want to talk to a doctor about it because I'd like to get counseling first and see if um counseling and like life therapy will give me some better coping mechanisms than what i currently have um i am kind of loath to go back on the medication not because i think the medication is bad for everyone i have friends i have a brother who it's intensely helpful for but i had some very bad experiences with it personally when i was younger so i don't really want to go um back on it if i can help it um, yeah, I, I definitely consume a lot of caffeine. Caffeine helps. 
Uh, but caffeine can also trigger anxiety attacks. So I have to be kind of careful about it. And there are a lot of days where I, I'm just vibrating in space. You know what I mean? Like I'm forcing myself to sit in a chair and try to work, but I can't focus. I can't get myself into the work headspace. And I just spend like four hours on a task that should have taken me 30 minutes. So like to me, that's not coping. Like, well, it's existing, but it's not living, you know? So like full, dis full disclosure, there's a lot of days that are, are not good days. There's a lot of days that are just kind of like I'm all over the place. But um, something that kind of helps, it's never going to like take away the full ADHD symptoms. But it helps me personally in a lot of different ways. As I come from a family of probably both my parents had ADHD. Like neither of them will cop to it, but I think both of them have it. Or my dad definitely did, but he's passed away. My mom says she doesn't. <laughs> but I see a lot of myself. Uh, Indy, what I want to do regarding that is I actually want to get therapy for the ADHD first and see if treating my ADHD will alleviate the anxiety symptoms because a lot of my anxiety comes from things that happen because I'm ADHD. Possibly forgetting things, the fear of not living up to a job's expectations, the fear of forgetting something and then going in to do the job and I'm just underprepared, that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping if I get treatment, like a holistic treatment too, not just medication, that's going to alleviate some of that, especially because I'm really, really hard on myself and I give myself a lot of anxiety. And then I can't understand why, like, this is going to sound really childish. I can't understand why it's okay for some people to be late on something and we just accept that. And, but when I'm late on something, it's a big deal into the world, right? I know that's really childish. But perhaps getting therapy for that will help me better deal with that. You know what I mean? I, fidget spinners and I are not friends. I do have, would you go get my fidget cube if you don't mind? I have a fidget cube and I don't use it because it's too loud. Um, but... Fidgeting with stuff helps a lot, actually, because it engages that part of my brain. So usually what I'll do is I'll bring a small sketchbook with me. And if I start feeling the urge to fidget, I'll just draw whatever I see in front of me. And that helps a lot because it's engaging that part of my brain. I can still pay attention. So um, something that does help me with like the memory loss or the short-term memory issues is one of them. Yeah, these are, these are the fidgets. I bought the fidget cubes back when they were a Kickstarter. And then I ADHD'd, forgot to fill out my survey for one of them. So I thought, oh, I didn't actually buy it. It never went through. So I ordered another and their communication was not good. So I ended up getting two of them. ADHD, hooray. You guys can't see me, but I was Muppet flailing. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. So I do have the short term memory issues. Um, I have goal pursuing issues. I have issues where I do not feel intrinsic motivation the way other people do, which I get the irony of that because I have a long form web comic and I like making series of things, but I get really prone to depression and burnout. Um, so I have to just kind of like accept certain aspects of my personality and then try to work around those aspects. It hasn't really helped. I can get that too. Like if you have a therapist who doesn't really get it or they're not ADHD themselves, it might not, they may not be able to do anything for you. When I was a kid, the doctor who was prescribing my ADHD medication, my pediatrician, he didn't give a crap. Sorry, he didn't care at all about how I felt. He did not care at all that it gave me really bad jitters. He didn't care at all that my hand shook like that all the time. He didn't care at all that I didn't weigh more than 68 pounds and I was 14 years old. Yeah, exactly. We lack dopamine so we don't get that reward in our brain. Um, so like, I feel that. Like I've had doctors who were very medication motivated and that was it. They were not interested in any other part of being ADHD. So I'm also like fully cognizant that I might have to sh shop around and find a doctor who will actually be able to counsel me in this. Um, but on that note, there's some really, really good books 
on ADHD. Give me a sec. I'm going to look it up. It's one of them's Driven to Distraction. Really, really liked Driven to Distraction. If you're not a reader, there's an audiobook version too. I can't do audiobooks because my ADHD makes me tune it out unless I'm driving. But what is that? That is not what I want. There we go. This book is great. Driven to Distraction is really great. It's not going to solve all your problems, but in some ways it's going to give you permission to love yourself for who you are. And for me, that was really important. Um, and there's another book he did called Delivered from Distraction. Oh, that's too long. Let me grab a shorter one. I, th I mean, the feelings might be valid, but I also kind of feel like at some point I should have gotten past being like petty, like, why does so-and-so get to have cake and I don't get to have cake? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, Messy has this really beautiful passage about the beautiful things ADHD can do for people's minds, and it got me to rethink how I felt about myself. So. For a really long time, I just saw my ADHD as like this really negative thing that made me a broken person and made me harder to love and made me difficult. And I spent so many years of my life trying so hard not to be ADHD anymore. But after Messy and after reading Delivered from Distraction and Driven to Distraction, I started to see that there are elements of my personality that came from being ADHD that were actually very beneficial. And the things I went through as a kid and as an adult with ADHD made me more empathetic. It made me want to stand up for, no, yeah, a strong, no, a strong sense of justice isn't a negative thing, but I also have difficulty sometimes looking at things objectively. I had to think about how to say that really really fairly. Um, my emotions often override what reality is. And I'm aware of that as an adult. But when I was younger, I wasn't aware that like everyone didn't feel as strongly as I felt about these things. Um, and that the reason I feel this strongly about these things is be partially because of the ADHD. So um, it, it just made life hard for me because I picked a lot of battles that were not worth picking at all. So anyway, um, one of the things that does help is I keep a planner and I've tried lots of different planners over the years. Um, and part of the reason this works for me is, as I mentioned earlier, I think both my parents had ADHD and both of my parents were planner people. So I grew up where this was very like just part of everyday life. Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel you, DJ Chroma. Like, the more I tried not to be ADHD entirely, the more it kind of cut down who I am inside. And the more I hated myself, and the more I could see flaws in myself. And conversely, the more I just kind of accepted that this is part of who I am, and it's part of how I'm, I'm made, and I tried to find positive things about it. And I also tried to find accommodations for the things that were holding me back. The more I was able to love myself and the more confidence I started to feel. Because I know a lot of us with ADHD, we're naturally kind of gregarious. We're kind of outgoing. But people have been so cruel about that. And we tend to be so overwhelming to other people that it's forced us to become shy, even if we weren't naturally shy. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that gregariousness can be a really wonderful thing. I have a lot of male friends with ADHD who are, they, they never had that shamed out of them. And they're just some of the most charming people I know. And like, they can be friends with anybody. And then there's me, I have like, I, I, if I'm like feeling really good and I'm emotionally really good, I can be very charming. Um, but I'm always second guessing myself. And then I'll go home and I'll have an anxiety attack about like, oh man, I said all these things that were probably out of line. And then I'll talk to the person about it and they'll be like, that didn't bother me at all. Yeah, I can get that. I can get that, Indy. I think, I think for, for me, okay, I'm gonna be like super duper real 
and probably will be like, someone will misquote me on this. I don't want it to be misquoted. Okay, all right, so I needed to bring my car in to get the tires replaced. And I didn't want to take it to the guy I often take it to, not because he's not trustworthy, because he's really trustworthy, but because I always feel like when I bring my car in, he makes me wait an inordinate amount of time. Like if I'm getting an oil change, it takes him two weeks to do it. And that, this really bothers me. Like, okay, that's not an appropriate amount of time, right? He's working on that apparently. He's a really nice guy. Um, he took a lot of cases, a lot of cars where the person couldn't really afford to get their car fixed and he'd fix it for them anyway. And I think he might be ADHD as well because prioritize, prioritization is something that isn't always the strongest. He does great work. It's the wait time that I had a problem with. And it just like really bothered me because in my line of work, generally, if I treat other people like that, they would never hire me again, you know? So like, I was really having a hard time with like, well, why is it okay for it to take him two weeks to do my car, but it's not okay for X, Y, Z, right? And that's like, A, I'm comparing apples and oranges. B, I'm assuming it's not okay for me to take the time I need to take because I've decided I need to work faster. It's not necessarily something me and a, and a client have even negotiated. C, maybe I'm not being completely honest with him with my time frame for when I need the car. Like maybe I need to be more upfront with like, hey dude, I need it like tomorrow. I'm not in high school. I don't live at my mommy's house. I need it like I need to go, right? Instead of the way I normally do where I'm just like, no, no, it's okay. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. But on the inside, I'm really mad, right? So that's what I mean by like, I need to be better about not letting my emotions guide so much of how I perceive reality. And I also need to try and be more objective about what's going on because like in that situation, I'm definitely not communicating my timeline. And I'm also not actually telling him what my expectations are, but I'm still punishing him for my expectations. And I'm holding him accountable for how I'm treated in my line of work, but we're in completely different lines of work. Right. So like over the years, I've been working harder to be a more rational, fair minded person and not just go with my my gut reaction. Anyway, way too much about that. So this is the thing. This is the thing that I rely on a lot. It's a planner. Y'all seen planners. Planners are great. Uh, not everybody can do planners. My younger brother can't do planners and he's ADHD as well. Several of my really good friends cannot do planners. Um, so I totally get if planners are not a thing that works for you. This is a thing that works for me. So that's why I'm sharing, sh wow, sharing it. Can't talk. Emotional deregulation. I'm going to look that up. Um, not that I don't believe you. It's the first, just the first time I've come across that term and I'd love to learn more about it because if it can help me compensate for it, that's a good thing. So, um, it helps to have like goal setting in here where I can see it because a lot of us ADHD folks, if we can't see it, we forget it. Um, which is why my studio is always a slob mess because I need the art supplies all around me. Also, sometimes I have to make personal rubrics. So like, for example, this is what is good progress on volume two of seven inch care. Cause I found that I was doing a lot of work and not making any progress. So I had to like sit down and actually list what I would consider to be good progress. Um, and then there's also just like ideas for things because that's another ADHD person shortcoming. That's not a shortcoming. We get so many ideas. Um, it's very easy to get very excited about them and then just get completely derailed. So I keep ideas in my planner and I also sketch ideas in my note, my sketchbook, just like super sloppy super sloppy sketches just to get the concept on paper so I can move on, move back to the thing I should be focusing on. But then when I need ideas, I can come back to my sketchbook and they're waiting for me. And so um, finding ways to like front load stuff has been really helpful. Yeah, bullet journaling, I can't bullet journal, but I know that it's super helpful for a lot of people. I would get 100% way too distracted with it needs to look pretty. <coughs> and then I would never actually get it done. So um, also customizing whatever planning thing you use of 
any sort is really important um, because for us, there's not going to be any one solution that works for everybody. So like I have a social media schedule with my goals for the month. And then I have a social media schedule where I write down like what videos went live, what days when I was doing March meet the maker, I wrote down what the different days were so I could reference it a lot. And I don't just have it like here. That's another thing that helps with my ADHD is having multiple sources of information that I can reference for, cause like, you know, we need things different ways. So like, this is just a printable with the different prompts. And I could have just like not written anything. I could have just checked it off, but I wanted to write down my ideas for those prompts as I had them. So I wasn't trying to come up with those ideas every day. I could just kind of act on the idea, which is what I also do for like when I do Inktober, I have a prompt list and I have all my ideas kind of written out. So I'm not trying to figure stuff out last minute because I don't do really well with figuring stuff out last minute. Sorry, I promise I'm not sick. I'm just, I need to drink some water. So something else I do is, um, so this is like my normal month ca uh, calorie view, calorie calendar view. And every day I do good work on Kara. I give myself a sticker as a reward and this helps me track what days I'm actually working on the project. Um, and I also write down like what I did that day. So when I'm working on volume three, I'll actually be able to create a Gantt chart and figure out how long it's gonna take me to work on the book. Because when we started doing press work for volume two, Joseph was like, hey, make a Gantt chart. Tell me how long you think this is gonna take. And like, I realistically could not tell him. I didn't have any idea at all. So this is going to help me work better with other people because it's gonna give me a better idea of how long it took me to do things. And I've been keeping, even though I get rid of like, like the weekly views, I've been keeping my note, my calendar views from prior months because this is gonna help with creating that Gantt chart later on. I also track things like, I've been tracking when I have anxiety and ADHD days because I wanna see how often those pop up. And something else, uh, one of my friends who has um, fibromyalgia suggested if I have sick days, like ADHD or anxiety days, I track them so that when I go into a doctor, I have physical proof, like this is something that affects my life instead of my word against their word. Because I know a lot of doctors are really hesitant to treat for this because they think some of us are just looking for drugs and I'm absolutely not. I really want therapy before I want any kind of medication, but I still think tracking it so I can show that this is a problem is a good idea. And then I also track like sick days. Like if I have a migraine, I track, um, I'm on a diet right now. So I track the days I'm calorie counting and the days I work out. You can use it to track any metric your, um, yeah, it is a bad time to cough. It's even worse to have allergies, coughing and sneezing. Everyone looks at you like you're about to infect them. So um, then I also have the weekly views and something I don't like about what this has turned into is it, tur it turns into just like a day-to-day -day checklist of what I'm working on. And I don't like that because I find for me, it starts getting kind of depressing because then my life just becomes a checklist. <clears throat> I don't like it, but it's really useful for me. So um, I'm gonna keep doing it until it's no longer useful. That's one of the other things is like, we're allowed to be flexible in this. We don't have to do 80, we don't have to do any accommodation all the time. You know, it's okay to like pick it back up when it's useful to you, for you or to neglect it entirely if you don't need it. So, um, these are, these are recent, this is this week. I try not to schedule, to write down too much to do stuff too many days before I'm gonna do it. So like you can see today's Saturday, right? So I only have like a few things here. <coughs> On Sunday, I don't have hardly anything because Sunday morning I'm gonna go in and write what I wanna accomplish for the day. And that kind of helps me. <laughs> you know what's funny? When, my, when I did work a nine to five, my life was not a checklist because it was literally the same thing every day. So I didn't have to make a checklist. I know what I find depressing about it is just, it's just like to do, to do, to do, to do, to do, you know, even fun things. I'll write fun things in my planner and it still becomes like just another thing I have to do. I, I love asking Jersey and Rob Stensinger about how much of their fun time they plan out and put in their calendars. 
though they probably they seem like they like sure, doing well, planners so planners. no like that's part of their fun time is doing their planner they on that schedule and their planning oh that's so disappointing that they asked you to stop um yeah so um i this might go into tmi time so i grew up catholic and um well i really i grew up presbyterian but then we converted when i was 12 and when i was presbyterian they didn't care about me fidgeting at all but the ch church we went to when we converted was very old-fashioned minded so even something like this they would see this as a toy and they'd have a real problem with it i so i started bringing mini sketchbooks and sketching and they had a problem with that also but it really doesn't matter what they think because that is a personal relationship that they're not part of and they don't have the right to judge how i am accommodating my needs but what i don't like about this fidget is it yeah it's noisy fidget asmr clickety clickety but uh you guys might notice my nails are atrocious and it's because if i don't have a fidget or a sketchbook i'll just start ruining my hands so <laughs> i'd rather i'd rather like quietly be rocking my fidget spinner than tearing up my hands i think that's almost everything for um how i know to accommodate things i also so I know some of you guys are not diary and not planner people, so I 100% respect that, but I don't necessarily have like a lot of advice for that, just because that was not, um, I am so reliant on this thing that I don't know how to fly without it, so I, I don't have any advice for that, other than post-it notes. Post-it notes are awesome. Um, but something else that helps with my ADHD is frankly just keeping it all in one place. So in the back, one of the things I like about this thing is in the back, I can add pages because it's an arc bound planner. So it looks like this. Um, and they sell inserts or you can print inserts, whatever. Um, so my notes section actually has like all kinds of different notes from something kind of dumb. Like one night I was feeling kind of bad and I was like, I don't even have an aesthetic. So I decided to like sit down and write all the things that inspire me and that I like. And I decided to keep it because it's like, you know what, when I'm starting to feel kind of tapped, I could turn this into an art challenge where I just have to pick three random things and find a way to make them work. Uh, let's see. Notes for podcasts that I'm listening to. Um, art supplies that I want to review. Uh, back here is where I track my classes, like uh, whether they've been invoiced and then who's canceled, unfortunately. Um, tax stuff, wedding stuff. What else? Mm, this is class stuff. So usually when I'm planning for classes, I take notes to help me prepare. Wait, this isn't class stuff. This, yeah, it's class stuff. Um, so. I will keep my class notes in with the week that class is going to be in and then after the class is over I move it to the back because if a class worked really well if I'm really happy with how it worked I want to take elements from it and integrate it into the next time I take that class and short-term memory is not my friend so keeping these notes means I can go back and reference these I don't have to memorize all this I don't have to figure it out every time I do it I can't do, I would love to do a Midori. I can't do the Midori for the same reason I can't have nice sketchbooks. No, you're fine. Um, I don't have headaches and migraines every day. I have them often enough that I need to track it because my neurologist died a couple of years ago. And when I have insurance again, I want to start going to the neurologist again. And one of the things that my old neurologist wanted me to do was to have an MRI because my grandfather died after three aneurysms and my grandmother on my dad's side died after an aneurysm and my aunt had a brain bleed. Um, she's still around, but like this runs in our family and one of the predicators of that is migraines. So he wanted me to have an MRI to see if there were any weak weaknesses in the blood vessels of my brain. Oh man, you have migraines and ADHD every day? That's rough. 
can because like if you're not man I can't imagine like trying to make myself work through a migraine every day and also dealing with like ADHD just sending my brain out into space <coughs> what are you talking about no it's not it's not a uh, patron only give me a give me a sec YouTube might be being weird sometimes it is Here, I just looked up my life with ADHD. Oh, okay. It's not a playlist? It, it is a playlist. Uh, I will grab that in a second. I used to do this playlist a lot. I, I'm sorry, not playlist. I used to do these vlogs a lot. And then I hit a point where I felt like uh, there wasn't anything new I could add to it because um, I kind of ended off with like, yeah, I want to start seeing an ADHD counselor. And I didn't make any progress past that. I still want to. Like, that that desire hasn't changed. It's just uh, a matter of, like, finding one and having the money and finding the time. That's The second one's the playlist. The first was just the search for it. Anyway, uh, I had a lot of fun tonight. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Um, I'm really pleased with the fact that we were able to get through the Edagame workshop and then kind of hang out and talk about other stuff. Like that was cool beans. It was a good Saturday night. So I'm going to say good evening to you guys because it's almost 10 here and I've been talking for two hours straight and I'm sure I will have a headache in the morning after that. Next week, I want to do a, another watercolor workshop. I want to do kind of like um, half pan pan watercolors, watercolor markers, and watercolor pencils. Ooh, random. Sh mm -hmm. You're talking to a doctor about that, right? That sounds awful. Well, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Uh, is Friday or Saturday better for you guys? Because for me, at this point, what are days of the week even? Because I don't mind switching the good night, Calvin, get some sleep, stay safe and stay healthy. Have a good evening, Nisa. Always down here begging for head pets. Okay. All right. Bye, guys. Let me know if Fridays or Saturdays work better for y'all. Because, like I said, Saturday's cool. Saturday works for me. <laughs> Doesn't really. Awesome. Okay. I can do Saturdays then. All right. Next Saturday, same time, same place. Bye, guys.